They're yeah. going out of their way to bring people with big audiences to cover the event. Yeah. To me, that tells me that they're ready to show something pretty spectacular. You know, let's see if that's the case or not. But um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on? Yeah, well, I want to set the excitement around 1010 aside for just a second. Like, I'm extremely excited right now just to see what it is that they've delivered and the fact that, you know, like we said, it wasn't Elon saying, hey, these are the features that we're going to roll out and this is the timeline. It was the Tesla AI X account that released yeah. that. And then Ashok was the one who rubber stamped it. So we've seen now Ashok over and over again has been extremely reliable in his predictions with timing of releases of different things. And so that is really cool to see his track record has now held up. Because I mean, when we saw that list, it was so incredible um, that they were going to be able to release all of those different features within that short of a time frame. And some of the things that are slated for release now in October are also really exciting. You know, version 13, potentially rolling out wide, which... I remember at one point, Elon said that they're going to keep version 12 around until it officially goes to unsupervised. Yeah. And so I think the implication is that there is an unsupervised-ish transition that's happening here in October. Yeah. And I mean, we certainly have all of the individual components uh, like it is now feature complete. Uh, as, well, it will be once we have just, the ability yeah. to reverse in uh, and do the auto park. So, I mean, it's just incredible to see the diversity of features that were like they didn't exist in customer vehicles a month ago and now they exist today. And then, especially if we fast forward another month and we get V13 and the, uh, the reverse, the auto park, and all that. It's a dramatically different car like two months of time and it's a dramatically different car and for six I was, year old cars for six year olds like i'm driving a 2018 model 3 i i was driving 12.3.6 i enjoyed it it was good um but it didn't feel magical and part of that is because it had worn off but just like the amount of effort that goes into you don't think it's very much but to managing, making sure that it will continue to drive because you're putting in the necessary inputs to the wheel and doing all the things, like 12.5.4 just feels like a chauffeur. Like you just sit there and watch and that's it. And you don't have to pay attention. You know, is the screen turning blue? Is there something I have to do? Do I need to pull on the steering wheel? Do I need to hit the scroll wheel? Like all of that just goes away and all of a sudden, experiencing robo taxi driving you around all by itself completely automatically and i almost never like my driving use cases are pretty simple they're pretty straightforward i don't have anything super complicated so for me and i'm not encountering you know i know a lot of people are saying they have uh phantom braking i don't experience those on my drives uh, there's, I've had maybe two instances this whole time I've had 12.5.4. For me, I get in my car in the garage, I tell it where I want it to go, and it just drives me there. And like the dramatic difference there is between the way that feels today versus the way that it felt two weeks ago, huge. And it reinforces the fact that this end-to-end -end approach that we have really is working and it is making yeah. steady and continuous progress because the question that I had, I was like, okay, we solved the compute bottleneck, but then we didn't see those wide releases very consistently. And so there was to me a concern that maybe there is a QA bottleneck that was behind the compute bottleneck because we're not seeing these wide releases. Like 12.3.6 was the only one that went wide for you know the course of about six months. And so it's like, okay, is that going to be hard for them to complete those the QA so that it can be safe for the whole fleet to receive these new updates? But I think what 12.5.4 shows is that Nick actually was right. And I'll have to give him like his huge props. All of those little releases that were just to the early access program, 
getting, they weren't rolling them out farther beyond that, not because they couldn't, they wanted to turn the crank and do another iteration and they were getting enough data from those EAP releases to continue to improve the system. Yeah. And so they didn't have to go wide to continue their progress. And so I think we probably will see something like that continue where the EAP, like we'll see this constant iteration with the early access program testers, but that doesn't mean that there won't be a wide release that is coming. And like, it's almost just like you see a lot of open source development happen where you've got the nightly update version of the software that's beta. And then you've got the stables. And so like 12.3.6, 12.5.4, those are stable release versions. And they're just driving forward the pace of development with these little point updates to the EAP program. And the difference between that and like the, the implications of the accelerated pace of change that we have for FSD in that world versus the world where, yeah, we've solved the compute bottleneck. We really are struggling to figure out how to make sure this is safe for the entire fleet at scale are just worlds apart. And huh. we, w- we had to see them actually deliver. So uh, I'm extremely excited. Take it away, Larry. Yeah, I, I think um, I'm a little skeptical of your projection of how the rate of release is going to run. My experience in this is that the rate, rate, rate of release is subject to uh, multiple different considerations. And it's very hard to predict what that rate of release is going to look like. I think they're feeling their way. And they're feeling their way in a new um, regime, in a new release and, and, and software regime. So yes, for sure, it's going to improve. The rate of improvement and the nature of the improvement, I don't think is predictable, even to them at this early stage in the process. But look, there's no question, what we're seeing is a very confident development team. Yeah, I mean, the team itself has really feeling, is really feeling confident. They're, they're, transmitting this you know in X they, they are broadcasting this um, and certainly what we experience on the ground is ju- is showing that it's justified so I think we're we are definitely you know in this new book I'm I'm pretty confident of it I see a lot of very butthurt comments from the Tesla Q <laughs> crowd and and you know I must tell you I would Two weeks before, two weeks ago, I was beginning to feel, God, this is such a optimistic view, this list that they put out. And here we are just three weeks away and we're not seeing it happen. How can it happen in, you know, in a matter of weeks? And it happened in a matter of weeks. It's truly amazing. Yeah, I think I think the scale of the compute and the inference is really that that's what's I mean, I think one of you two mentioned this, but that's that cannot be understated because I am, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, the cluster they just threw up in Texas that they turned on a long time ago, that thing's not going to be, that thing's not going to be cranking anything out until a few months from now. They have exactly to train that stuff, right. right? That's a whole nother right. level. It's a step change. So, it, it, it's a step change. And so we're not even at that point yet. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a very exciting time. I do think... You know, I'm very curious to see if this release, if, you know, once it goes, um, once all the cyber trucks have it, uh, once it's covered, you know, during 1010, because I'm sure they're going to say something about it. It's like, hey, our entire fleet now has the ability to, you know, if we get the release of Auto Park, you know, summon and banish, um, and then they start teasing version 13 during that 1010 event, which would make a lot of sense to me, right? I do wonder if the rest of, you know, and none of this is going to be financial or, or uh, investment advice, but worth talking about. I wonder if the rest of the uh, market will start to become wise to this development. Because, you know, my biggest thesis has been that the, the stock will not react to any of these developments until they can show net income in the bottom, bottom line that's generated from this technology. 
I'm really curious to see how, how the upcoming events with self-driving will, uh, will sort of maybe motivate the market to think differently about these releases. Yeah, I think that, you know, remember, we're still $150 roughly off of the all-time high share price for Tesla. And so I think that we could see, you know, volatility between now and the major move could go as high as, you know, 350 And that's still really just trading sideways in this range that we've been in all-time highs in 2020, 2021. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of the value that was described to Tesla at that point in time was related to FSD revenues, which we haven't really seen come in. And so Larry's point, if we do see a much better outlook on starting to monetize FSD at a higher rate, even setting aside robo taxis, we have a lot of room between here and previous all time highs for the stock to move. Um, but then the real move that is the long-term move really does have to do with what you're saying, which is we need to see major money flowing through to the bottom line from robo taxi. And that is different and Mm -hmm. distinct from software revenue from FSD. I do think the unsupervised piece too has a variable there because you know, the unsupervised FSD software suite, one would think that Tesla can charge a significant premium on that versus the current offering, which is supervised. Even though, you know, even if you're not touching the wheel, you just have, you know, your sunglasses on or whatever, it works. And it works great. Like 1254 on my car is freaking awesome. I have a 2021 Model Y. My God, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. It's by far the best uh, update we've had. But I mean, I've been raving about the last few ones because for my use case, it works 99.99% of the time. But I, I know that I'm not most use cases. I think the unsupervised piece, though, you, you really think about the value proposition. Value proposition on, on that. We had um, we had car dealership guy uh, on our channel a few months ago. One of the best cha- uh, to follow on X car dealership guy for the general car market, and he bought a, a Model Y very recently. And he talked about how the current FSD is for him is a gimmick more than anything. Like it is useful in some cases, but he doesn't really view it as a super value add to him because he he still has to pay attention. For him, the real value proposition comes when he no longer has to pay attention because now that time, okay, I can I can do emails, I can, you know, I can do texting, I can watch a movie, blah 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 blah. You go down the list. And the amount of people that are willing to pay to earn back time is a humongous number of people and those people generally generally the people that are aware of how much their time are, is worth are very wealthy. So you're going to have a gigantic amount of people that really care about their time. They're all going to move to this brand because this brand is literally going to give them back time if they're not already being driven somewhere. And I think that's going to unlock another thing with, with us. I mean, obviously they have to get there, but it's a curious thought experiment. Yeah, and, and and you know what's interesting is that the value of FSD versus RoboTaxi. Now everybody's, you know, very excited about RoboTaxi, and for good reason. I mean, there's no doubt that it has huge financial value, but I don't think we even begin to understand. Yeah, so I think there's huge value in FSD without RoboTaxi, and I think you know we're kind of losing. That, that thread, um, but it, it, it's very, very valuable. I think there's a role for Uber with Tesla uh, robotaxis in the sense that robot, Tesla, Tesla robotaxis will be in the Uber fleet. Uber does have a brand, and Uber will compete with their Tesla robotaxis, not with the Waymo type taxis, not with not with all those uh, lidars, but they will find their feet with uh, Tesla Rover taxis. There is absolutely no reason why they can't compete with other uh, Rover taxi um, enterprises that use the Tesla vehicle. After all, you know they have a huge market uh, presence. They have a huge brand name. And for them to offer Tesla Rover taxis when everybody else is offering Tesla Rover taxis is a no-brainer. I mean, I I don't 
think that Tesla's fleet of robotaxis are necessarily going to be the only fleet of robotaxis. I think the fleet operations are as important as the technology. Not mm -hmm. more important, and and the technology is not more. I think both have to be perfect for the for the winner to win. And I think there are going to be multiple winners. I think that there are markets in which Uber is going to play a role. So, no, that okay. that's, that wraps it up. So I disagree with everything you just said. Okay, oh, and then there, I want to talk a yeah. lot more. <laughs> so, so I. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure it's part of Tesla's ter terms of service. And Elon Musk openly said that the only place where you'll be able to operate your Tesla autonomy as a robot taxi is on the Tesla network. But let's let's say that's let's say that's allowed. It has an app already, right? And they own manufacturing of these vehicles. So they they can make, say, a million robot taxis, two million, five million robot taxis per year, right? What is the sense of taking that product and putting it, allowing a competitor to put it on their network, right? And then that competitor puts a markup on there that you wouldn't otherwise have on your own network. And that price gap, that markup becomes your go-to-market strategy. The Tesla app to get a taxi 20% cheaper than anywhere else. And the, literally the point of friction to download that app is just going on your app store and downloading it. And all of a sudden this app store, this, this app, becomes a gateway for everybody to actually experience a Tesla product. Why, why, why would Tesla give up that advantage? That to me seems insane. You know, just just build an ecosystem on your on your robotaxi network. Tesla owns a robotaxi network. And that's kind of like what I'm thinking about We Robot. When that We Robot thing came out for 1010, they're building an ecosystem where the fleet management is going to live on the Tesla network, right? Tesla won't manage the fleet but they'll create the ecosystem so fleet managers can exist on Tesla's ecosystem. You know what I'm saying? So like, why would Tesla give that up? 